Hosanna to the son of David, the king of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Dear brothers and sisters, from the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by repentance and self-sacrifice. Today, with the whole church, we herald the beginning of the celebration of the Paschal Mystery. On this day, our Lord Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem and was welcomed as king with palms and shouts of praise. Today, we greet him as our king, though we know his crown was a crown of thorns and, the, and his throne a cross. Therefore, I invite you to follow our Lord this Holy Week, from his triumphal entry, through his suffering and death, to the glory of his resurrection. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says to you anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. We praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed for us, redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was held as king by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Sanctify these branches with your blessing, we humbly pray, that they may be for us signs of his victory. Grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our king and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hosanna to the Son of David, the King of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ. Amen. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children say, through pillared court and temple, the love be simplest and the best. 
from all heaven they followed with an exultant crowd the victor palm branch waving and chanting clear and loud the lord of earth and heaven rode on in low estate nor scorn that Hosanna in the highest, that ancient song we sing. For Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of heaven, our King. Oh, may we ever praise Him with heart and life and voice, and in His blissful eternally rejoice. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first He suffered pain, and entered not into glory before He was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, Who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide with him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Please continue to worship and stand as we say together Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so, so far from my cry, and from the words of my complaint. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, in the night season also, but I find no rest. But you remain holy enthroned by the praises of Israel. Our fathers hoped in you, they trusted in you, and you delivered them, and they called upon you and were delivered. They put their trust in you and were not confounded. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by it all and the outcast of the people. All those who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and shake their heads, saying, He trusted in God, and he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, if he will have him. But you are he who took me out of my mother's womb. You were my hope when I was yet upon my mother's breast. I have been cast upon you ever since I was born. You are my God, even from my mother's womb. O oh, go not far from me, for trouble is near at hand, and there is none to help me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, sorrowful even to death. 
remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And so, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. And then he came up and laid his hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? He will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels. And how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went outside to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. 
After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and, brought, and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they, gave, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, 
they mocked him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him in the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemek sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. But when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Please pray with me. Almighty God, as we enter into the mysteries of our salvation and the work of reconciliation that Jesus did for us from his entry into Jerusalem until his rising on the third day, Lord, please open our hearts to the truth of the gospel. Give me a mouth to preach and give us all ears to hear. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this entire reading from the Passion narrative according to St. Matthew is it's painted on a backdrop of fear. It's painted, on, I would say there's a, a tableau of dread behind all of this. And from year to year as we hear this read, and we'll hear the Passion narrative, not always from Matthew's Gospel, but that's one of the Passion narratives every three years. And then we always hear St. John's Passion narrative every year on Good Friday. But we become accustomed to this. And as, if you're following our daily office readings, if you're following along, along in the readings for uh, the Christian year found in the back of the prayer book, you're going to come three, three or four times through this reading about the crucifixion, the suffering of Jesus. And after a while, we begin to lose that, that sense of impending doom 
that was behind all of this, for, certainly for our Lord Jesus, and we should be feeling that as we read this scriptures. And I think that is particularly important for us in this season of Lent in the year 2020 because we are, we are reading this and we are going through Lent and we're entering into Holy Week with a backdrop of fear and with a tableau of dread and with a sense of doom. People are, are afraid and people are, in fact, some people are terrified right now because of what is happening in the world. The whole world is being shaken by this pandemic, not only the fear of, of illness and, and in some cases death, but also how this is uh, wreaking havoc with our day-to-day -day lives. Who knew that we would all be giving up church for Lent? You know, it's like, you know, it's like we have topped Lent forever and ever this year. And so we need to hear this again and hear it with that sense of impending doom, that sense of dread, and not run to the empty tomb, but to walk with Jesus through what he was walking through as he came to, into Jerusalem. Because Jesus, if you, go, if you go all the way back to where this passage in Matthew's gospel really has its literary, be, literary beginning, the passion narrative really begins in Matthew chapter 26 at verse 2, with Jesus stating once again that he knew he was going to die. What is it when you feel like you're going to die? If you know you're going to die, you have a sense of dread. And this is what he says. He says in verse 2 of Matthew 26, you know that after two days the Passover is coming. And the disciples are thinking, yay, Passover. And Jesus is probably going to be set up as king on Passover. That will be awesome. And then Jesus says, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Over and over in all of the Gospels, it is clear that Jesus knew that he was going to die. He lived his life. He did his ministry with the backdrop of knowing that he was going to die. He knew when he was going to die. He knew who was going to be guilty of the events that would lead to his death. He knew exactly how he was going to die. He didn't just say, I'm going to be killed or stoned. He said, I'm going to be crucified. He said that he would be crucified. And in Matthew chapter 20, right before the triumphal rent entry, that was Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, right before the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, <clears throat> where we started this Palm Sunday. This is what Matthew's gospel says. Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, so he's getting ready to enter Jerusalem for the triumphal entry, he took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. Yay, we're going up to Jerusalem. And then Jesus says, And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. So right before the glorious triumphal entry, immediately and immediately following it, bracketed by that event, Jesus is explicitly telling his disciples that he was going to suffer supreme injustice, that he was going to be humiliated and tortured and killed. You know, irony, that sense of irony was not a well-developed sensibility in the ancient world. Ancient writers didn't use irony as a, a literary uh, construct. People didn't go around with a sense of irony in the ancient world, generally speaking. But how painfully ironic. The shouts of acclaim, the praises, the jubilation, the waving of palm branches in the air all must have seemed to, seemed to Jesus in his humanity as he knew where that palm-strewn road to Jerusalem was going to lead. He knew. There was a backdrop of dread. Yes, Jesus also foretold his resurrection in, in union with foretelling his passion, but the knowledge of his death was no less terrifying to Jesus than the knowledge of our own deaths are to us, even as we await our resurrection. 
You need to see where Jesus really fought the battle that would get him through that, those, those terrible moments. Uh, how did he deal with the dread, with the angst, with the, with the impending sense of doom of what was about to happen? You need to know how he dealt with that, how he fought that battle that got him through the suffering that was to come. <clears throat> that suffering which was to uh, in, uh, usher in our salvation. And he didn't fight, this is so important, he did not fight that battle in front of the Sanhedrin. He didn't fight that battle in front of Pilate. He didn't fight that battle on the cross. It was fought, Jesus fought that battle where humanity's first battle was fought and lost in the garden. Jesus fought his battle with what was about to happen, not in front of the Sanhedrin or Pilate or on the cross. He fought it where humanity fought and lost its first battle. For Jesus, the battle was fought and won. Jesus fought and won the battle with terror and dread and with all that was to happen in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 37, where our reading, our, our account of the passion began this morning. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, my soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Jesus didn't face this moment as a superman. He faced it as a fully embodied human being because he had to fight the battle in the garden just like we lost the battle in the garden as human beings. And so Jesus is very sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You know, the first blood that Jesus shed for our redemption wasn't at Pilate's whipping post. It wasn't when they pressed that crown of thorns down on his scalp and pierced his brow. It wasn't when the nails went through his hands and feet as they fixed him to the cross. It was in the garden. That's where the first blood of this battle was drawn. Luke's gospel says it clearly. Luke chapter 22, verse 44. Luke's passion narrative says this. And be, Jesus, and Jesus being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. That is where, that is where the blood of our salvation began to flow. Here is the point. People are terrified in this world right now. You need to know that the knowledge of his coming death was no less terrified, terrifying to Jesus than the knowledge of our own deaths. In fact, his horror exceeds ours because he didn't just have to face the pain of his death or even the shame of the death or the ending of his bodily life. He also faced the fact that he would be taking upon himself the penalty of humanity's sin. That's the battle that's being fought in the garden. That's what the dread is. It's not just that he's going to die a painful and shameful death. He's dreading that he has to take the cup that the Father offers him. And we know what the cup is because the cup is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 51 verse 17. It is the cup of God's wrath. Father offered Jesus the cup of wrath. Jesus knew that he wasn't just going to suffer and die, but that he was going to be crushed for our iniquities. C.J. Mahaney writes, he says, Knowing the hour for his death is fast approaching. This is the battle moment. Jesus has come to the garden in need as never before of his Father's comfort and, in, and strength. Instead, hell, utter separation from God, is thrust in his face. 
And that is the moment of, of the greatest conflict. What will he do? Yet not my will, but your will be done. You see, in his great love for the Father and his great love for us, Jesus accepted God's will in spite of the terror. And he did that because of love. He loved his Father and trusted his Father, and he loved us. Charles Spurgeon, God bless him. He said, Jesus took the cup in both hands, and he drank, he drank damnation dry. Jesus took the cup in both hands and drank damnation dry. And from the time that Jesus left that garden where the battle was the hottest and the fray was the fiercest, until he offers up his cry of dereliction and gives up his spirit on the cross, Jesus retained after that moment his composure and his peace through all that was to happen because he knew he was fulfilling the Father's sovereign plan of love. For sinners like me and you, Jesus was in control and Jesus was at peace before the Sanhedrin. If you look at this, this narrative that we just read, and if you go through all the passion narratives in all, all four Gospels, you see that there's one person that is like the fixed point in all that happened in those hours between the arrest of Jesus and the crucifixion, the person who retains his composure, the person who never loses his decorum. Jesus is in control and at peace before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate, and even as he is beaten and scourged and mocked like a lamb before his shearers is silent. Or a lamb before the slaughter. As he was nailed to the cross, even then he retained his composure. He forgave his persecutors. He even offered a repentant criminal on the cross beside him eternal life. In face of terror, Jesus trusted the Father's will. Brothers and sisters, we are facing terror about our future. Some of us, I know right now, if it hasn't already happened, you're seeing it happen. Some of us are terrified because we're going to lose our jobs. It's going to happen to Christians. Some of us may lose our homes. I, I, I know people right now who are afraid they're going to lose their homes because they can't pay their mortgages. They're terrified about their children are supposed to go to college this fall and they can't pay for college now. And they're even afraid that they might die. Christian people are feeling this way because of the pandemic. But friends, because we're united to Jesus as believers, we can, even in the face of that terror, just as Jesus did, we need to get on our knees in our garden, in our prayer closet, and pray and learn to trust the Father's will. This is our Gethsemane moment, church. This is our Gethsemane moment. In this time, we need to fall on our faces before God like Jesus as it says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, in the days of his flesh, in the days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up prayers. He's thinking specifically of this moment, the writer of Hebrews is. Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. To him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. When we come out of that garden moment, we can face the suffering that might be before us with the same peace that Jesus faced Holy Week with. Because he lives in us by his spirit. He'll walk us through this moment again. 
Jesus fought his battle with suffering in prayer, and that's the only way we're going to face the suffering that will come into our lives as we walk the way of the cross with Jesus. You know, Western, rich Western Christians are shocked that we should have to suffer, that we really aren't in control. That's why it is a severe mercy that we are going through what we are going through right now in the United States and throughout the West and, yes, all over the world during this Holy Week. We are reminded that to follow Jesus is to follow the one who went not up to joy, but first went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Brothers and sisters, Western Christians, you can't enter into joy before you walk the way of the cross. You can't be glorified until you, until you take that cross upon you that Jesus said we had to take up your cross and follow. God is showing us mercy. He's showing us the deficiency of our shallow, trivial discipleship. And I know my discipleship was shallow because it's shaken me. Why am I so worried? Why are you so worried? You see, we prayed it this morning. We pray it every morning uh, on Friday mornings at morning prayer. We ask God to mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the, the way of life and peace. This ends at an empty tomb. This ends with resurrection victory. But brothers and sisters, if we're going to be like Jesus... Right now, starting in the garden with him, we're going to be like Jesus. And we're going to have to walk this way with him all the way to the cross. It is the way of life and peace. We will find strength and hope. It begins in our garden of prayer in that time of Gethsemane, that Gethsemane moment where we cry out to God with, with tears and with loud cries to the one who can deliver us from death. And as we trust in him, he will deliver us. Come what may, we will find his, his power for living the Christian life and his supply even in the midst of loss. If you're thinking of, look, you're, <laughs> some of you really are about to lose everything. But I want to assure you as your pastor, I didn't, I heard this from a young woman in Iraq. She said, you don't know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you've got. You're going to find out that you have all you need. God is going to provide for you. Even in loss, you will be provided for. He's still clothing the flowers of the field. He's still adorning those birds of the air and feeding them. That hasn't stopped yet. And he'll take care of you too. Just hold on to the cross. Cry out in Gethsemane with Jesus, and he will bring us through. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you 
pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Please offer signs of reconciliation and peace and don't touch anybody. <laughs> God's peace. God's peace. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I want to welcome you on this Palm Sunday as I get out the holy, holy hand sanitizer. This is a special hand sanitizer just for the liturgy. Now, it's the only one we could find. So. I do want to welcome you to Christ Church, those of you who are watching online and, and the, our, our group of folks here that are necessary to make this service happen uh, for you. We welcome you in the name of the Lord as we enter into this holy week. I want to let you know a few things that are going on in the life of Christ Church and how you can stay connected with uh, your church family and with others in the Christian community and certainly as the, hopefully this will, uh, will help you in your walk with the Lord this week. Uh, we're going to have all of the Holy Week services we normally have with um, some additional ones actually and those will, those will all be streamed online. We're going to start with our Monday Thursday service, Holy Thursday service. It'll be 7 p.m. Just go to the Christ Church website, and you will see that streamed live. If you just go to www.christchurchws.org, and you can watch that being streamed live and participate in that service that way. Uh, as, all, as we have been doing, if you are on our mailing list, you will be sent the service guide and the songs that go along with that. So uh, if you're not on the mailing list, just go to the website and go to the contact form and let us know you'd like to be placed on the, on the mailing list and we'll get those out to you. Uh, on, then on um, Holy Friday at 2 p.m., we'll be live streaming again at the Christ Church website. We'll be live streaming the Seven Last Words of Christ devotional. And then we're probably going to be doing a stream at 6 p.m. on Facebook. Don't know yet, but... Uh, Probably, we'll let you know if you, if you stay up with, uh, go to our Facebook page, go to our website, and we'll give you the way to stream with that. But we're going to, weather permitting, we'll be doing the Stations of the Cross outside of the Christ Church, going around the churchyard and doing the Stations of the Cross. That devotion will be at 6 o'clock. And then the actual Good Friday service will be streamed live on our website at 7 p.m. The peak of the Christian year for us has, uh, Christ Church certainly, but I think with the for the whole church is really the great vigil of Easter, which begins after sundown, uh, begins after sundown on Friday, I mean, excuse me, on Holy Saturday, uh, this coming Saturday, uh, which is the, is it the 11th or the 12th? I think it's the 11th, Saturday the 11th. At 8.30 p.m., uh, we will stream live the great vigil of Easter, and please join us for that. Uh, we'll have um, the new fire, we'll have the Paschal, uh, we'll have a new Paschal candle, We'll renew our baptismal vows. We'll rehearse all of God's salvation history. And it's a wonderful, the great way to begin the uh, Feast of Easter. So please come to that. I want to remind all of us uh, during this time when we're not gathering, those of us who have an income still, uh, please be generous to those who are in need. Uh, we, I do have a benevolence fund that I have uh, access to. If you'd like to give to the benevolence fund, then, and I can disperse that as needed. You can make a check out to Christ Church for that in particular. We have our food pantry that needs uh, food and volunteers in this time, so we can be helping our neighbors. And also, please don't forget your church. Uh, your church needs your financial faithfulness as well. God will faithfully bless you as you are generous. We're promised that in Scripture. And so you can still give by going online to the Christ Church website. There's a, a, a giving button at the top of the page and on the drop-down menu on the side. And so you can give online, or of course, you can still mail your check to the church if you want to do that. But I would encourage you uh, that in this time, we especially need to be diligent to, to honor our commitments in financial giving to our church. Uh, keep your eye on uh, all things uh, Facebook on the, on the Christ Church account, not on all things Facebook generally. 
put on the police stone, as a matter of fact. It'll be bad for your spiritual life. But look at the uh, Christ Church uh, Facebook page from time to time. There's content going up there frequently. And so we invite you to, uh, to watch that and, and be encouraged throughout Holy Week. Try to have something for you every day of the week. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who for our sins was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself who by his suffering and death became the author of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of heaven, 
power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we have sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection... He broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our, of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him so that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. I invite you at this time, if you are able, to kneel for the prayer of humble access. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, and Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb.
You may be seated. Prayer after Holy Communion is on page 137 in your Book of Common Prayer. It will also be projected behind me on the back wall. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with spiritual food in the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, fathers, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and to serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and